Welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 build guide, my friends. I hope you're all doing well. Today I'm going to be covering my pick for the best support cleric in Baldur's Gate 3. I previously did a build that was a more all-rounder character, and that ended up as a tank and damage dealer and support hybrid for a cleric, but a lot of people had the question, what if I want my cleric to be more of a full-time support for my party? And so that's the build that we're going to cover today. I'm of course using Shadowheart as the example character because she's the party's cleric, but if you wanted to build this as a custom character, it's of course very viable as a main character and can be used to support any party no matter what the makeup is. Unlike the other build, this is going to be a lot harder to play solo with because it's a more support-oriented build, although not impossible, but I would definitely recommend the Tempest Cleric version if you wanted to play a cleric solo through tactician mode. As always, to start with, with Shadowheart or any origin character, the first thing that we have to do is fix their stats. Shadow Hearts actually are not as bad as many of the Origin characters by default. This is pretty close to a decent stat spread for what you want, but there's definitely some improvements we can make, namely getting rid of the three odd numbers. You never want odd numbers in D&D stats, so let's fix that. We also don't need any intelligence, so we can drop that down, get ourselves to 16 Constitution, and unlike my other character where I recommended 14 strength because that one would be mixing it up more often in melee, this character is playing more of a supporting role and so we go with 14 dexterity because the initiative is very important and also because you will be in medium armor for most of the game and so the extra dexterity really comes in handy. Most medium armor caps your AC bonus at from dexterity at 2, so 14 dexterity gets you there. If you were building this as a main character and choosing your race from the beginning, I would not recommend high half elf like Shadowheart, because it's actually one of the weakest cleric races in the game, unfortunately. The reason for that is that the cantrip that you get from being a half-elf is based on your intelligence score, which we want to lower as much as possible to put those points elsewhere, and the armor and shield proficiencies that you get from being a half-human are wasted on the cleric, because cleric already has shield and light armor proficiency, so you don't get any bonuses from that. As usual, the most powerful character, if you are going to, most power powerful race to choose for this character, if you're building it from the ground up, is Wood Elf for the extra movement speed, or Githyanki for the once per day Misty Step, which is a very powerful mobility tool. We also, of course, are going to need to fix her spell selection, but first, let's talk about domains. Shadowheart by default is a trickery domain, which is unfortunately the weakest of the seven cleric domains. I believe there are three cleric domains that stand out uh, above the others as being the most powerful. Those three are life domain for healing, light domain because it has one of the most powerful defensive tools in the game, and tempest domain which I talked about extensively in my other guide and is the best all-rounder cleric build because of the heavy armor proficiency and extra damage that you get from Tempest Domain. Life Domain gives you the very powerful Disciple of Life healing feature, and you get that at level 1, and it increases the healing output of any spells that you heal with by uh, the spell level plus 2. This, especially on something like Healing Word, almost doubles the spell output. And so you might think that the natural choice for a support cleric is to go Life Domain. However, we're actually not going to do that. The reason for this is that what Life Domain gives you, you get no spells that aren't on already on the Cleric spell list, so you, you don't actually get anything from your Domain spells that gives you additional utility beyond what a Cleric offers. So you only get the Heavy Armor proficiency and the, class, uh, the subclass features no new spells from going Life Domain. And the subclass features, while very powerful for low-level healing spells, get worse and worse as you level up because you never want to spend turns healing in combat. To sort of illustrate this, let's imagine uh, Cure Wounds, which heals 1d8 plus 3 or 1d8 plus 6 with the Life Domain feature at level 1. That's an average healing of 10.5 from a d8, which averages 4.5 plus 6. An incoming Greatsword attack from an opponent is going to do, on average, 10 damage. 7 from the 2d6 that it rolls, plus 3 from 16 strength, which is pretty typical at that level. You can see that we're barely breaking even on healing, and we're spending our entire turn for the enemy spending their entire turn. 
This is usually a bad trade because typically you're going to be outnumbered in this game. And also it costs you a spell slot every time you do this, whereas the fighter that's hitting you can just keep, they're not going to run out of greatsword attacks. So usually you don't want to spend your turns healing in combat. It's a very inefficient use of your actions. Therefore, I think that actually the best uh, support cleric class is the light domain cleric, even though it is considered a damage-oriented subclass, it provides you with one of the best defensive tools in the game, Warding Flare. Warding Flare allows you to use your reaction to gain to impose disadvantage on an enemy attack, and you can do this an unlimited number of times. Clerics normally do not have very good uses for their reaction, so adding a, a reaction into your cleric build is extremely valuable. Um, Every character in combat has every round of combat five resources that they can use. Their action, bonus action, reaction, movement, and concentration. Clerics have excellent uses for their concentration and excellent uses for their action, but they typically don't have very good bonus actions or very good reactions. So the Light Domain Cleric gives you a ton of uses for those action economy resources that would otherwise be going to waste, as well as giving you a bunch of spell access that's not on your spell list. Even though those are mostly damaging spells, getting access to new spells is better than doubling up on spells you already have. So for that reason, we're going to be picking Light Domain. At level 1, this gives you Fairy Fire, which is also an excellent supporting spell, because giving all of your allies advantage on their attacks is very powerful. The enemies do have to fail the save, but also having access to Fairy Fire lets you break invisibility on enemies, which is extremely valuable throughout the entire game. So you definitely want to have this available on a character, and having it always available through it being a Domain spell is very powerful. For our cantrip selection, we are going to take Guidance, of course. It's the best spell in the game. Um, and for a support character, makes a lot of sense as well. You definitely still want Sacred Flame, even for a support character. Just some turns, you're going to have nothing to do, and this is a good way to spend your turn. Also, Radiant Damage. It being Radiant Damage is quite useful against some enemy kinds. And for your third spell, I actually strongly suggest Blade Ward. You can use this before combat starts to gain two turns of damage resistance to all incoming damage, which is extremely powerful. You can also use this when two groups of NPCs are fighting one another to tip the battle in favor of one of them or the other without aggroing any of the participants, which can be funny in certain circumstances. Um, and... While it's not usually a good use of your turn in combat for the same reason that healing isn't, uh, having the damage of two attacks for one cantrip is the same as negating the damage of one attack in terms of total damage by casting Cure Light Wounds. So if you cast Blade Ward on a character and then they get attacked twice, you are effectively doing the same thing as if you had cast Cure Light Wounds, but not spending a spell slot on it. So while you usually will not want to use this in combat, it does come up sometimes. I'm going to also talk through what we will typically have prepared in our spell list at each level as we level up. This is a, these are going to be rules of thumb. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that in Baldur's Gate, you can change what spells you have prepared anytime you're not in combat. So you can and should frequently change what these spells are based on the situation. Because we are a support character and just a character, a cleric in the game, our number one spell selection is going to be Bless. Your typical turn is going to... Uh, in the early game and even on through the mid game, your typical combat is going to open with you casting Bless as your concentration spell on three allies who are going to be attacking, spending the rest of your turns spamming out Sacred Flames or crossbow attacks uh, with the occasional command. If you want to remove an enemy from combat, command is an extremely powerful single-use spell. And with your bonus action, you are going to be using Healing Word on anybody who needs it. Healing Word is extremely powerful because it doesn't take your turn. And one thing to keep in mind is that with this kind of healing spell, what you really want to do with it is use it on an ally who has already gone down to an attack before they fail their death saves or are killed by an enemy, because that gets them back up uh, at full health. And so you can use this... It, it's exactly the same spending healing word on that character as spending any healing spell that takes a full action. 
Um, so it's very a very efficient use of actions should your allies be going down in combat. Finally, for our last two spells, these are less important. I guess at, at level one, you'll only have access to four. I do like having Guiding Bolt equipped. Sometimes you do just need to hit stuff, but you could also have, consider uh, Create or Destroy Water is very powerful. I also quite like Sanctuary. It has a lot of uses. Similarly, it's a bonus action that doesn't take concentration, and you can use it to like block a doorway with an invincible ally and do all kinds of really fun stuff with this um, ability. I highly recommend playing around with it and seeing what cool combos you can do with it when you have Sanctuary up. At level 3 we get access to second level spells, and the Light Domain gives us two damaging spells, but Flaming Sphere is actually one of the better support spells in the game as well. Um, it does take your concentration, and you do have some redundancy with it, but anything that summons an ally can block doorways, can uh, divert enemy attacks, and preventing an enemy from attacking your actual ally is just as good as healing that damage or anything else. So it's it summons are a form of support by stopping an enemy from uh, acting. Um, you also just get Scorching Ray, which means you can take Guiding Bolt off your prepared spell lists because you now have a really good uh, direct damage spell if you want to spend your turn just damaging something. My advice for this spell selection is we're going to take Guiding Bolt off and we're going to take um, get rid of Cure Wounds because that shouldn't have been on there in the first place. The most important spell is also Spiritual Weapon because this is a summon that doesn't take your concentration and is a bonus action. So you could summon a Flaming Sphere and a Spiritual Weapon in the same turn or, and this is going to be your most common play pattern throughout most of the game, cast Bless and summon a Spiritual Weapon in your first turn of combat and then spend the rest of the game peppering in Scorching Rays, or Commands, or just uh, Cantrips, or Crossbow Bolts as appropriate, while continuing to defend your allies. Also remember that you are a shielded medium armor character, so you can very much get in the face of enemies, and because you have your Reaction Warding Flare, you are actually better defended than most... Um, heavy armor characters at this point, or just about any other character at this point. Warding Flare against most common DCs the, is going to be about a minus four or minus four and a half to your enemy's attack roll. And so it is almost the same as a shield spell, but doesn't cost you a resource to use. So it's extremely powerful to just put yourself in the way of enemies and force them to waste an attack against you, especially at low levels where they often won't get multiple attacks a turn, and your reaction can be used to negate their entire turn's worth of actions. Finally, you probably want um, Hold Person, although I personally am not a tremendous fan of this spell. It can be very powerful, but often I think you just would rather use Command. The reason that Hold Person, I think, is weaker than Command overall is that it takes your concentration, and the enemies get two saves before it costs them a turn, once when you cast it and once at the beginning of their turn. So overall, um, I would steer clear of Hold Person typically, and uh, mostly just take Spiritual Weapon and your Domain Spells as level 2 spells, and we'll stick with what we have from level 1, just to give us a bunch of optionality. At level 4, we get our first feat, and because we are a cleric, our feat is just going to go straight into improving our wisdom. The only other option here, I think, for this character is... I guess there are two other options. One is alert, because going first on a support character is extremely powerful. If you go first and alert will basically guarantee that you go first in every combat, you can cast Bless ahead of your allies acting, which is very valuable. Also keep in mind that if your whole team wins initiative, you get to choose the order in which they act. So you can have your cleric cast Bless, followed by someone moving up to create a threatened area, followed by your rogue attacking and gaining sneak attack. Um, make sure that you are acting in the optimal order of your 
characters, not just the order that they're presented to. When you all win initiative, you get to act, you get to choose the order that you act in. So high initiative is really good, and I highly recommend taking alert if you don't want to take uh, bonus wisdom. The other option here is warcaster to prevent yourself from losing concentration. Clerics are going to be concentrating on spells all the time, but for the most part, I think you are better off either with alert if you want to really focus in on your supporting role and not worry about casting spells with save DCs, or just Wisdom, which is probably the best choice, because one of the best things you can do is cost opponents a turn with Command. Also bear in mind with Command that you can upcast it at a higher level to cause multiple enemies to lose a turn, which is extremely powerful and valuable. At this level, I would probably select Resistance here. It doesn't really matter what you have, but Resistance can be useful in some conversations, because whenever you're asked to make a saving throw in conversation, it can come up the same way that Guidance does whenever you're asked to make a skill check. At level 3, we get Fireball, another valuable option. So Scorching Ray and Fireball from the Light Cleric domain are both really valuable for clerics, because clerics normally don't have a good thing to spend their turn on that isn't a concentration spell. Um, so Scorching Ray and Fireball let you add some damage in while also providing the, the powerful support spells that clerics normally do, Bless, um, Spiritual Weapon, and Healing Words, and so on, which are very valuable. At this point, I am going to suggest that you take... I really quite like having Mass Healing Word. Just the ability to get everyone uh, some health back on your team is really very powerful. Uh, you also almost certainly want... You should be using Scrolls for Revivify if it comes up, so don't worry about taking Revivify, but you, know, you can prepare it and cast it if it's like the last thing you're going to do before you take a long rest. Uh, I quite like having Animate Dead, the... Zombies are extremely valuable sometimes. You can get really clever with their positioning. And even though you're a support cleric, you probably still want spirit guardians just because you can get in there and mix mix it up. This is more because you don't have a lot of other like really important options at this level. Um, and sometimes the best thing to do is just get in, in their face and do damage. You are slightly less good at this than the Tempest Cleric version of the build but you are also less likely to be sustaining concentration on Call Lightning or something like that, so Spirit Guardians is a really good damaging option. And there's some fights where this is just the best possible way to deal with enemies. Just turn on Spirit Guardians and run around in the middle of all of them, uh, if it's a bunch of low health enemies. Also, bear in mind that Spirit Guardians still works when you're jumping, so because we have 12 strength, we have a okay jump distance, you can gain quite, uh, quite a few additional Spirit Guardians hits if you jump through enemies and make sure that, that you're gaining additional movement speed that way if you don't have another use for your bonus action that turn. Cleric level 6, we get the whole reason that we're in Light Cleric, or one of the reasons we're in Light Cleric, which is that now we can use Warding Flare on allies as well. For all the reasons, it's good on us, not costing a resource, being an enormous uh, pain for enemies. This is incredibly powerful when cast on allies. This is especially powerful in combination with a wizard's shield spell. You can use both of them at the same time, and this can keep your wizards or, or whatever squishy allies you have alive very well. For our prepared spells at this level, no major changes. I would su suggest taking kind of whatever you like at this point. Um, you could take, like, I actually quite like having Remove Curse prepared just because I don't like unpreparing it and then re-preparing it every time I want to cast it. It's just a little micro I don't like doing, but whatever you want to pick at this point that you think is cool. Uh, protection from energy does come up sometimes in some encounters. You know that you're going into, like, an enemy group that's all fire, and you could do that. Um, Lesser Restoration also does have its uses in some combats, and Aid is an okay action just to give your ally a little bit of extra maximum health, but don't use it as a healing tool in combat. I would typically avoid spending spell slots on that, though. So my pick here, because we already have most of our tools that we're going to be using in every fight, I would just take something that you uh, kind of think is fun or that you want to have available. Bearing in mind that if there's a particular spell you really want, you can always prepare it. 
At level 7, we get access to level 4 spells, as well as Wall of Fire, which is an excellent spell to have access to again. Um, another very powerful damaging spell, but one that can really be used to break up fights. Enemies will try to move around it so you can block them off. Uh, there's a couple encounters in the game that this spell just solves by itself, so keep an eye out for those if you're like defending a hallway from a group of low health enemies who are rushing towards you, a wall of fire across the doorway will end that encounter immediately. That said, we probably want to have a couple good combat options prepared. I actually quite like having freedom of movement prepared, not because we want to cast it, it lasts all day, don't cast it at the beginning of the day, but more because we don't have a lot of uses for our level 4 spell slots at this point. Um, and this can be, in an emergency, a really good option. Breaking an ally out of a stun can be very powerful because a stun is such a powerful effect, and there are some enemies, common enemies in this game, that stun very frequently. So you won't cast this as a day-long buff or at the beginning of the day, and you won't cast it that option, but when you want it, you really want it. So I quite like having it prepared. And Banishment is just an excellent spell overall. It's basically a Think of it as a double command. So command is they fail a save, they lose a turn. Banishment is they fail a save, they lose two turns. Um, sometimes you're going to want to command four enemies with that level four spell slot rather than one big enemy, but having both options available is good. At level eight, we don't make any particular changes and we take the same feat that we did before. At level 9, we get access to a few new spells, although these spells are less valuable than previous spells. We get uh, Destructive Wave, which I said in my previous video was unique to Tempest Clerics. It turns out it's actually unique to Tempest and Light Clerics, so you get both of this. And you get Flame Strike, which is the best, one of the better damaging spells in the game as well. Both of these spells are really good to have access to as damaging options. Um, and again... Remember that while we're getting all these damaging spells from being a light cleric, we still have all of the support spells that clerics normally get. So it's not like we're giving up support spells to have access to these damaging options. You still just get the damaging options and the support options. At level 5, though, in terms of which ones are good, I think Insect Plague is the only one that's particularly powerful. These options, like uh, Greater Restoration, you are going to use Freedom of Movement, because that removes stuns the same way that Greater Restoration does, and Charms and Petrifications are much rarer, so you wouldn't really need to prepare that typically. Um, there's a couple fights in the game that Planar Binding can be useful, but you are going to know which ones those are in advance, and you can prepare it appropriately. Insect Plague causing difficult terrain is very valuable. And I will say that another way you could build this character is with the Nature Cleric, because they get Plant Growth, which gives you no concentration, difficult terrain. That's a very powerful effect and worth uh, keeping an eye out for, but then of course you're giving up on Warding Flare, which is incredible. At level 10, you get access to your Divine Intervention, and the mace that you get from casting Divine Intervention is really good for this character. It's got a, a healing aura attached to it, so definitely keep in mind that you can use that. Um, get another cantrip, which it doesn't really matter what we pick, and our prepared spells don't change in particular. Just slot in whatever you think is going to be valuable to you at this point in the game. Level 11, we get access to level 6 spells, which include um, Blade Barrier, which is an excellent damaging spell that also does difficult terrain, which is very valuable for slowing, al uh, slowing enemies. Create Undead and Planar Ally. I like Planar Ally a little more. I think the Diva is a little more useful than the Create Undead, and I think typically what you're going to spend your level 6 spell slot on is the Planar Ally, although another good use of the level 6 spell slot is just a level 6 um, spiritual guardians so that you can just do a ton of damage in an AoE around you, but what you're going to want most of the time is just the extra ally. There's just a lot you can do with a, a summon, and you can heal these guys and stuff too, so it's very much worth picking up. There are also some fights where immunity to frightened is good, and you might consider preparing and casting Hero's Feast ahead of that. I typically would not prepare heal even though it's a huge amount of healing and is one of the better 
ways to spend an action on healing just because it's so action efficient. You get so much healing out of it. I think it is worse overall than preventing that damage from coming in by having a summon tank it instead. And for our final level, we have two choices. We can either take a feat, um, which I would again recommend that your feat be alert or warcaster, depending on whether you're finding yourself needing to win initiative more or needing to maintain concentration more. Personally, I prefer alert. Um, overall, I think winning initiative is going to matter more than not losing concentration. A lot of the time, what you're concentrating on is something like a bless that you can just recast. Uh, for not a huge cost if you happen to lose concentration. So Warcaster, I think, is less important on this character than it is on many characters, and Alert is very valuable. Another option that you could take if you wanted to is uh, you could respec your... or you could take another level, and you could take a level of Paladin or Fighter. I would suggest taking Paladin for the... Oath of the Ancients Healing Radiance, because it is a decent support option. It's just because it's a bonus action, and it gives you a little bit of healing. It's useful for getting up downed allies, mostly. Um, and adding a little bit of Lay on Hand healing is very valuable as well. If you do this, you will need to respec and take Paladin as your first character level and then all of your levels of cleric because if you go level 11 cleric if you go cleric 11 paladin 1 you won't get heavy armor proficiency but if you start as a paladin and then take your 11 cleric levels you'll get heavy armor proficiency so your choices here for your last level are basically between alert as a feat heavy armor proficiency from a paladin level or heavy armor proficiency and some minor healing uh from a paladin level Um, or Warcaster, I would as a as another feat. Personally, I think that Alert is the best bet. Um, there's lots of medium armors in the game that will give you almost the same AC as a heavy armor character, but Alert is incredibly difficult to duplicate, so I would highly recommend going with that. For items, you are just going to be wearing the best medium armor and shield that you can find. Your weapon doesn't matter in particular. Um, because you're mostly going to be casting spells in combat. So just take whatever decent one-handed melee weapon you can find and make sure you have a crossbow equipped. With 14 dexterity, you won't be doing a ton of damage with um, with your crossbow attacks or a ton of or hitting that often with your crossbow attacks. But if you check whether you're more likely to hit with a crossbow attack or a sacred flame, then you can gain a little value there just alternating between the two at early levels. Also, of course, as with any spellcaster, anything that increases your spell DC is incredibly valuable, and you should equip those whenever you find them. Finally, I do have to mention one item that I mentioned in my previous cleric guide uh, that actually does not work quite the way I think I thought it did, so I'm issuing a correction here on the Staff of Arcane Blessing. I said that this doubled your bless, because that's what the tooltip says. Uh, it bless grants an additional 1d4 to saving throws and weapon attack rolls, and, and an additional 2d4 to spell attack rolls. I read that as it adds that those to it, it you know, gives you an additional, but actually what this means is it replaces the effect of your bless with that. So it only increases your spell attack rolls. It's still a very valuable tool with a warlock ally or wizard ally casting scorching rays. And you can use it with this character. You can use it on yourself to increase your scorching ray uh, accuracy. And so I still think that you should keep this staff around and keep it equipped. But it is not as broken as I thought it was. Still very valuable for you with scorching ray for warlocks with eldritch blast and so on. But uh, just thought I should get that correction out there into the world. All right, my friends, I hope that you have enjoyed this look at the best support cleric in Baldur's Gate 3. If you have, then of course, feel free to leave a comment and uh, hit like on the video because that helps me a ton with the algorithm. And you can subscribe to my channel for more Baldur's Gate 3 build guides and other strategy game content. Cheers, my friends, and I'll catch you next time.